Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is my video blog. So, over the last week, let's see. Um, I don't quite remember when I recorded the last video. I think it was Friday night of last week. I just got back from a friend's birthday party. Uh, well, party is not quite the right word. Um, but a birthday gathering in a comedy club where we did some trivia first. Uh, yeah, it was kind of fun. I, I might have talked about it a little bit more then. I don't really remember it all that well right now. The next day, I took a trip all the way out to Staten Island and, and, um, so this was for an archery program that I had, uh, won a drawing for, but it turned out that it was only for kids. But it was interesting, Staten Island really doesn't feel a lot like New York, and uh, on the, uh, and it was a really long trip. Uh, just, just generally, it's, it's not a quick place to visit from anywhere else in New York. You, you can take the Staten Island Ferry, which is free, but it takes about half an hour. Or you can take express buses from Manhattan, which are faster, but I think it costs like six or eight uh, bucks. I'm a little bit surprised at how Staten Islanders deal with uh, with poor connectivity to the rest of the city. I mean, I'm sure it's a, a major issue for them, but it just seems like they're really not, they're much less well-connected than, than the rest of the city, and it's got to be really difficult for them to live in their borough and work in a different one. I've, I've heard about developments that uh, that people are trying to, uh, to, to start um, to, like on the North, uh, North Shore of Staten Island, uh, there was an article uh, in one of the local periodicals about, um, about uh, the uh, efforts of developers to set up luxury condos there. But it just seems like an uphill battle because it, with New York, it's such a big deal where you live. Um, if, you're, if you live too far from the subway or too far from any decent buses, then you're really pretty stranded. Uh, you're going to have a tough time participating in the cultural life of the city. And that's really a big part of why somebody would want to live in New York in the first place. It's it's an expensive city to live, uh, to live in. It's, I mean, I guess there's work, but you still have to get to work and you have to get back from work. Uh, and so sometimes, I mean, if if you plot the, the prices of, uh, of real estate in the city, at least, if I if I understand right, generally, the closer you are to public transit, the more expensive rent is because it's, it's that desirable. Because if you have a fifteen minute walk to get from your uh, to your apartment to the uh, to the nearest transit option, you're going to be doing that at least twice a day, probably three, four, maybe more times a day. Uh, it just changes the convenience equations. You're going to shop outside your neighborhood a lot less if you have to travel more. So yeah, I, I don't. I don't get how efforts to to start to develop Staten are, are going to work out unless at some point they hook it into the subway system. Um, anyhow, yeah, I went all the way down there to uh, to this park in the middle of Staten Island. It was nice. It didn't feel at all like New York City, but um, I mean, it felt kind of like uh, so different cities in the United States have different notions of what's urban and what's rural. And by New York, by New York standards, this was semi-rural. Uh, it didn't have a city feel to it, but probably by, I don't know, by Pittsburgh standards, which I'm also familiar, this, this would just be a slightly out of the way area within the city itself. Um, it just felt like a slightly underdeveloped area, but it was still... I don't know, just, uh, it didn't meet the population norms of, of New York City. Um, but yeah, it was out in the middle of, of Staten Island. Kind of a nice park. Uh, but there were just all kids there. I, I didn't really check the age requirements. I, I thought, no, it's, it, it isn't that I didn't check the age requirements. It's that ordinarily if you see an event that says like eight and up, you might parse that two ways. You might think this is a kid's event um, and eight is the minimum age. Or you might think this is a, a kids and adults event, um, and you have to be just at least eight for safety reasons, but you could be any age. 
And I thought that it was more of the, the latter, but it turns out that it was the former. So it was just a bunch of kids doing the archery thing. So as soon as I saw that, I hung out for a bit and then I just, uh, uh, I just started the trip back. Passed by um, some, uh, some Jesus freaks who were doing their own little festival uh, in another part of the park. And it was very loud, kind of ridiculous, but um, yeah, decent trip back. Uh, and yeah, actually, uh, that day I had, yeah, I had, I guess I, I will talk about this. Uh, I'm, I'm generally not the most successful person romance, uh, romance wise. Like it just seems like different people are living in different worlds of experience. And I, I noticed this when I was at a coffee shop er, uh, earlier today, um, which I, I just chose to go to that coffee shop because they have an ATM, need to get some money for laundry, but it's also just a cool place to hang out. So I brought my Chromebook and uh, worked on stuff for maybe an hour. Uh, and some people at the next table over were, uh, or maybe it was just a few tables over, they were just talking about, um, like the guy was explaining to this, uh, uh, to the girl about, um, about some experiences that his friends were going through. And apparently like these were kind of guttery people who dreamed about being really rich. And they lived in, in a world where most of the stuff that they talked about was like rich people and deception and people being tricked and and mansions and people finding fortune through some uh, through some quick business means or a stroke of luck and then losing it really quickly too. Uh, and yeah, they uh, he was just telling this long story about how his. Uh, his friend had come into a lot of money and then lost it really quickly somehow. It just seemed kind of ridiculous. Um, but it made me think a little bit about the way that I live my life and the kinds of models of human behavior and the kinds of things that I tend to fill my life with. And other people, I mean, they fill their lives with different things and they organize their social circles. They, their dreams are full of different things. Their notion of what's important is full of different things. And to me, like wealth is not that interesting of a thing. It's good for security. It might get you a slightly nicer apartment. Um, might give you, uh, it, it might let you be a little bit more picky with your job. But I mean, I grew up, I grew up in a relatively wealthy in our, uh, in environment, actually pretty wealthy environment. And I just, I don't think of money as something that you either talk about a lot or, or that you think about a lot. Um, I mean, if, if you if you notice your finances is dwindling, then you're going to do something about it. But it's not an obsession. Uh, money is just a tool. It's a tool that you need, but it's not it's not the purpose of life. And the idea of like having a mansion or a fancy car or something just the, these the the people sitting a few tables over were talking. He was trying to impress her, I think, maybe or just talk about what was meaningful to him and express himself. But like cars and owning, uh, owning buildings and, and uh, people stealing things from other people and living a party life and stuff like that, that just seemed to be what they were about, or at least what he was about. I mean, I got the feeling that might've been a date between the two of them. And she wasn't talking as much. It was mainly him talking about this, this series of events and I only listened for a little bit and then I got back to my, uh, to what I was working on, but just, it got me thinking about how, how much effort we put into, to shape our, our mental world that we live in. Like the, the kinds of things I, I fill mine with, my mental world are like scientific ideas, philosophical ideas, programming, uh, knitting, creativity, stuff like that. Um, and it, it reminded me like some friends of mine talk a lot, uh, uh, talked a lot about TV or, uh, talked a lot about, uh, a lot more about food than I, I do or th think about these things. And they're really very meaningful components of their lives. And 
I mean, uh, some of these some of these things I approve of. Some of them I disapprove of. Obviously, the the people a few tables over, I didn't really think that they were making a great use of their uh, of their lives. But um, I mean, there are plenty of things that are are decent. That I just haven't chosen to focus on. Uh, that I haven't imbued a, a lot of personal meaning into, but I mean, other people just organize their lives differently. And it's interesting how I think we often end up choosing our friends or figuring out like if we're compatible with someone romantically based on what kind of overlap we, we see and these, uh, these pillars of meaning that we, we deal with in life. Uh, like what do you put on top of the pillar? Um, what are what are your dreams? What uh, what are the good things that you're looking for in life? What are the things that you're trying to avoid? Even how how people work, like I guess I normally tend to give the most uh, the the spotlight to to interesting ideas, people who have interesting ideas, not not the TED talks uh, TED talks type of like shallow um, change the world necessarily ideas like all you need is a good idea and all the difficult bits of reality will bend. Um, I'm more think I, I, I tend to think more about ideas being dropped into reality and what needs to be done to shape reality to uh, to put them into action. Um, th that kind of thing. Uh, I, I, and politics and like philosophy isn't necessarily an abstract pursuit, although some some fields more so than others. But, but I, I, it's, it's these memes, it's, it's having the ideas move from person to person and change maybe in some subtle way or maybe in some deeper way, how they perceive the world. Those are the interesting things to me. Like, I guess the, the biggest question that I've ever, uh, that I've usually organized my life around is, uh, what is the nature of the mind? And I'm interested in that from... From a, at a lot of levels, I mean, on a societal level, it's an interesting question. What is an individual citizen or, or person? What is uh, what does human civilization? What do the worlds that we build out of our minds look like? And how do we, as a species, work to achieve our ends? What are our ends? Uh, how should we organize ourselves? What does humanity look like in a society? Not to the individual level, like how do we think? Uh, what happens during moments of insight? How do we frame problems? Uh, what What is the role of custom? How do we deal with our emotions and all of the other things that uh, that come together to make us functional human beings? How do we function better by some metrics? What does it mean to function better? And down to like molecular level, what what's going on in the patterns that are well, I mean, I guess this is above molecular, but what, what's going on in the patterns, uh, in the shapes that uh, that are the, the graph of the connections between our neurons? What are the functions of particular brain regions? And and so on. It's, it's questions like those that uh, it's driven me to be really interested in a lot of subjects in life because it touches on everything. Now, I'm, I'm sure other people have their own notions of what's interesting. And, and maybe some of them are expansive, maybe some of them aren't. Or, I mean, the, the notion that we live inside of stories and that we build stories to encapsulate ourselves to make sense of a reality that has a lot more raw data than we really know what to do with. And we need to mark some of it as relevant, some of it as irrelevant. Should have got more tea before I started. But, uh, um... But yeah, it's it's the focusing on what what in reality is important that uh, that helps us actually li uh, live our lives. And so I have this feeling that we need to have at least reasonable overlap between how we shape the world and how the people really close to us do if we're really going to understand each other. Um, like I, th I th imagine, I would probably have a really tough time building more than a activity-oriented friendship with the with the guy at that table over there. Most of my uh, my friends, we've connected on an intellectual level. We like tossing ideas back and forth, like shooting the breeze in, in politics, philosophy, science. 
would challenge each other's ideas, things like that. Um, but that's, it's not the easiest thing to find people interested and suitable for that. And building genuine connections hasn't been something that's normally come uh, easily to me. And I mean, there are other difficulties that I'm not going to go into uh, because this isn't a therapy session. It's, it's a blog session. But um, yeah, I, I had a weird permutation of events that led to my having two dates with two different people uh, last weekend. So after the archery program, I had a date with somebody on the Upper West Side. And then on Sunday, uh, I had a walk in the park date. I guess date is really, it's really like meet up and, and chat. Maybe that's what dates are. I mean, it wasn't really the old fashioned date, like get dressed up in a suit and go to some event with somebody who you m might already kind of know, or maybe not. Just meet up, see if you get along. Um, it went okay. Uh, they, they were decent conversations. Uh, they probably, if we do end up contacting each other more, then it might end up leading, uh, Probably both of them will end up leading more towards friendships. There, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the second one was more promising than the first, but I imagine there might have been some political arguments. Maybe not. Um, I mean, they, I, yeah, but uh, I found both of them attractive and interesting, but I, I'm just not sure. I'm not the easiest person to get along with, and I didn't feel a lot of enthusiasm from, uh, from either of them which I'm kind of used to. I, I generally, many months go, uh, go by between uh, between dates, and they generally never go beyond a, a first go. But uh, it was it was nice. Walked around. In, uh, so yeah, on Sunday, I walked around in the park with, with the second one. Uh, ended up in the coffee shop, chatted for a while. Um, uh, yeah, I, and uh, let's see, on, on Monday, had a migraine for most of the day, but it lifted up near the end when I ended up going to a philosophy uh, event where we talked about um, Plato and, and democracy. And largely, so the, the topic of, of the meetup was, I think, is democracy, uh, is it a good thing? Is it, uh, what kinds of virtues are needed to sustain it in a society? Things like that. It was interesting, although I, I ended up bringing uh, Aristotle into it, because Aristotle had this interesting idea where you have three types of, three basic types of government. Uh, you have a democracy, an aristocracy, uh, or, a, uh, or a monarchy. And each of these comes in a positive and a negative form. And uh, generally the positive form corrupts into a negative form eventually and then it's replaced typically after a revolution by one of the other positive forms. So like you start off with maybe an aristocracy, uh, aristocracy. After a certain number of years, it goes bad. It rots. Cultural reasons. Uh, your, your aristocrats become uh, greedy. They lose the virtues that make them worthy of ruling. And they become corrupt and eventually weakened by their corruption. And then you have a revolution and then maybe a good monarch comes in, sweeps them aside, and rules for a while. Eventually, uh, eventually uh, your monarch becomes corrupt and becomes weak. And then at some point, uh, a uh, the people rise up, and a democracy comes uh, comes into effect. And it's great at first, but then eventually the people lose the virtues and uh, they become. Uh, and, and their, their lack of ability to plan, their disorganization, uh, they, that system eventually rots. And it's replaced by one of the other two. And you just have this endless cycling, or at least that's what Aristotle thought would happen. And, and you might be able to make a case that, uh, like American democracy, has become corrupt enough. Or, although you might be able to make that case intuitively. Although I suspect that Aristotle was actually wrong on this in the sense that if you look at the early days of American democracy, it was actually a lot more corrupt than, than modern democracy in the United States. Now, there are some events that you could look at, some problems that have developed that are particularly difficult. Um, 
I would probably say uh, the most pressing one would be the development uh, development of modern. Uh, of, so when 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 marketing firms started to hire psychologists to prey on quirks of how people think in order to improve advertisements, I think that that was a very dark day for humanity. And political campaigns at some point started to hire psychologists and started to really learn to tune their messages to manipulate people uh, to vote certain ways. And that was another dark day for humanity. And I think that, that one, one could make a case that, that that's a tool that wasn't there early in the uh, in the early days of uh, of the United States. So that that was probably a really backward shift. But if you look at the early days of the United States, you find very corrupt people who almost came to blows uh, against each other because of fierce political disagreements. I mean, this myth of the founding fathers being blokes who manage to agree with each other on a lot of things. It's, it's, it's rubbish. Um, you almost immediately had the first two political parties of the United States, the, um, uh, the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party. They almost immediately emerged. They almost immediately, uh, uh, they did, they, they didn't coexist very well. And they, every time one of them got elected into an office, typically they would purge all the civil servants of the other and appoint their allies into, uh, to, to complete, uh, completely fill up all the government posts uh, for, uh, uh, for anything that they controlled. Uh, it was called the spoils system. And it came to a head, I, I think, uh, in like the 1880s, 1890s, when eventually you started to see reforms that limited and then eventually removed the problem. Um, and you, you started to have this idea of an independent civil service. But before then, <clears throat> corruption was really quite rampant. So we've actually made a lot of progress in cleaning up uh, American democracy. Uh, it's, it's by no means clean. And there are plenty of financial interests who will always have, have an uh, always be looking for a way to gain influence over the system, but it's, it's better than it was. Um, so, uh, I mean, there, there, there have been other people apart from Aristotle who had this idea. A, a more refined um, version of it uh, was from um, a uh, Arab philosopher and scientist by the name of uh, Ibn Khaldun, um, uh, who, who had this political theory of uh, of of the rise and fall of dynasties, and they would come into being in one generation, and he would trace uh, a number of historical dynasties that he had information about uh, over several descendants of the people who founded the regime, and he would notice that generally, like three to five generations in, uh, the regime would be fully corrupt, and it would be swept aside by a completely different dynasty, and uh, he. He formed this political theory, kind of Aristotelian. I mean, it's important to remember that a lot of the, a lot of the the classical Arab thinkers had access to the ideas of Greek and Roman antiquity, um, and they took these ideas and improved upon them, just as, uh, just as the Greeks and Romans took each other's ideas and improved uh, upon them. I mean, people talk a lot about. Um, Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle, but they were by no means the only important uh, Greek philosophers. There were many, many philosophers that, that are worth uh, reading about. That most of them preceded um, Plato by by quite a uh, by a reasonably long time. But um, but yeah, there are many great thinkers. It was a society of, of thinkers and to a certain extent warriors. But um, it was a society where ideas had a lot of punch. And um, and this this was also true to a certain extent of the um, of the the Arab dynasties at the time. And Khaldun he he played he, he the politics of the time they uh, you, you've probably heard of uh, like Machi uh, you might be familiar with Machiavelli's life and his attempts to align himself with various factions in proto-Italian society. 
um, different different families, advising them on military and cultural matters, uh, things like that. And the Arab society, at, uh, or the various Arab dynasties at the time were, were fairly similar. And Khaldun uh, attached himself to uh, the, the Muslim Spanish, uh, one of the Muslim Spanish uh, regimes. Um, and so he, he lived in, in southern, uh, uh, southern France for a time. Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, southern uh, Spain for a time, and uh, and advised some of the rulers there on how to handle their affairs, and presented these historical theories. Um, he, he moved around a lot, but uh, I forgot how I got onto this topic. Oh yeah, Plato and democracy. Uh, anyhow, um, it was an interesting meeting. I uh, might have. Uh, at least made it a lot weirder than it otherwise would have been by bringing Aristotle into it. Because the, the point of, of my bringing Aristotle into the discussion is to cast doubt on the idea that democracy can be stable and virtuous long term. Now, admittedly, American democracy and generally Western democracies in Europe, it might be a counterexample, but I thought that it was a fun, mischievous point to make. Um, <clears throat> on Tuesday, I had a first phone interview with a company uh, that I might be doing uh, might be doing some contract work for, which would be cool, good to have income. Um, <clears throat> on Wednesday, I went to a uh, a panel discussion at the American Museum of Natural History on uh, it was called Our Genes Ourselves, and it was on uh, it was a panel on genetic testing and the ethics of that, the technologies involved in that. <clears throat> they, they had a speaker uh, from the New York Genomics Institute, I think, um, which is a gene testing uh, group that, that does te uh, research and also performs gene testing. Um, it was pretty interesting, although they had a sociologist there, and I just never like sociologists. They, I think the field is mostly rubbish. Uh, it's one of those activism, uh, it's one of those fields that's activism that's pretending to be academic and rigorous, and it's generally not. It's people with a lot of opinions who like to tell other people what justice is, and, uh, I don't know, cram all that stuff down people's throats. Now, I mean, philosophers do that too, to a certain extent, but we're at least honest about it. Uh, we don't pretend to be scientists. When, when something is, uh, comes from our values, when it's an opinion, generally, generally, we won't, we won't, pro uh, we won't pretend that it's absolutely right. Now, you will find some exceptions, but, but sociologists are just generally full of shit, and they had a sociologist there who was uh just would not shut up and she really didn't add anything to the discussion and i do feel a little bit weird just saying that because she she is from a, a pair of minorities that you don't often see in in panel discussions uh and that she she's a black woman but she uh but she is a sociologist and apparently She's made a career out of just battling about, uh, on about race and injustice and all that, uh, and uh, having the chutzpah to lecture other people about, yeah, I, I just, I wouldn't say, say that she ruins the discussion, but generally I did my best to tune her out, uh, because, I mean, she also just was talking about really different topics than, uh, than anybody else there. Um, she probably should have filled in an uh, evaluation chart and told him in H what I thought, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, it was a generally interesting discussion. Um, let's see. On Thursday, I had another migraine, uh, but I ended up going to a to a, 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 a Pearl meetup at, um, at uh, MongoDB, uh, which has its headquarters uh, here in New York. And uh, it was by Mark Chase, uh, It was a presentation by Mark Jason Dominus, one of the uh, better-known programmers uh, out there, uh, about a billing system that he wrote and a bunch of fun gripes and insights that he had while writing it. Um, 
Although a little ways into it, I got the, the feeling that I had somehow heard him talk about this before. And it turns out that he had actually done a, a blog that covered most of what he was talking about last uh, November or December. And I was just remembering that. But still was neat to meet up there and ended up uh, having some nice, uh, having a nice chat with uh, one of the people who works at MongoDB. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a good evening. I mean, I really wish that I'd had it without the migraine, but I have to deal with a lot of migraines in my life. We all have physical faults. Uh, I guess there are worse ones that I might have. Um, and then yesterday, uh, I went to a bad movie meetup, and two films were on the roster. Uh, I only ended up staying for one because I woke up really early that morning, and I was pretty tired by the time uh, by the time intermission came about, which I think was something like 10.30. Uh, but yeah, the first film was called Tammy and the T-Rex, and it was what a film. It, it was amazingly, appallingly bad. Um, it, uh, I guess I'm going to spoil it. It's an old film. You can go look it up. You can probably find it on YouTube. Um, the premise was that there, there was this a girl who used to date this really slimy, violent guy. She might have broken up with them. And then she gets kind of romantically involved with a nice, nice boring jock guy. Uh, the old boyfriend comes along, beats him up, uh, or tries to beat him up. They get into a lot of fights because every time the old boyfriend sees her with the new maybe boyfriend, he gets violent. Uh, eventually things escalate to the point where he... Uh, he takes the, uh, the bad, the ex-boyfriend takes the new kind of boyfriend, drops him in, in a zoo where he's mauled by a lion, taken to a hospital. Then a mad scientist shows up, kidnaps him, and takes his brain out and sticks it into a, dino, uh, into a, uh, into a robotic dinosaur, which then proceeds to go kill the old violent boyfriend and then kill a bunch of people and, uh, then starts to romance again with the with the girl in the uh, while well, he's in the dinosaur body then there are weird complications with trying to find a new body form kidnapping the scientists police shootouts um and it ends with a really uncomfortable and weird strip tease uh, yeah it is a weird film um and i don't think i could really describe it actually in a way that makes it make more sense than that, than that. It's just very, very 80s, and it doesn't quite manage to be charming, but it's not, it's not like soul-sapping like Red Zone Cuba. It's just bad, but kind of, kind of amusing. Um, uh, that was yesterday, and today I've just mainly been doing laundry, and, uh, and it sounds like one of the neighbors uh, has to own a car, which is a little bit weird. Uh, yeah, they, they got it. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm feeling, uh, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty helpful on the job front. I have the, um, I have the contract work thing, and I might be uh, also starting to interview with one or two other companies um, in the near future. I generally don't like to mention the names of companies here, just, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel more comfortable like not mentioning interviews until and unless they're passed. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that things will work out. Um, hopefully soon. Since it would be nice to be insured again, it would be nice to have an income again. Uh, plus, just the, the routine of working is, is, is pretty nice. And uh, I mean, I guess I could just... Uh, again, I could put in the effort and, and really try and make the teaching thing a full-time gig, but that's, uh, I don't really want to do that with my life. I, I think it's more interesting to have that be a side thing than a main thing, and just dealing with people's schedules and, and locations and stuff. It might be different if I had easy access to a computer lab, uh, and but but right now I don't. And, uh, and also just dealing with, with the migraines, uh, I, I don't know, it's, it might not work out so well with teaching. Maybe it would. Uh, I mean, the, the meds do help a lot. 
Um, yeah, so that's pretty much where things stand. Uh, not a lot else going on. Um, I've been gotten uh, gotten back into uh, making uh, burritos a lot for uh, for lunch. I, I get into like these food habits where I end up making a certain dish uh, a whole lot for a few weeks, and then I stop eating it all together for a while. Um, and it's interesting how, how much my tastes end up shifting around a lot. Like right now, I'm in a burrito mood, and I've been eating a lot of burritos recently, but that means that like there are salty uh, um, snacks that I, I eat when I'm in other food moods, but I haven't been eating a lot of them while I've been uh, like doing this probably what will be about two weeks of a, uh, of a burrito kick. I guess it's maybe that the, the salty uh, flavors don't really go all that well with, with this particular snack. Um, but, yeah. And I guess I, I'm hoping soon to get the, the, the dev kit 2 of the Oculus Rift in. Um, it should be a, a lot of fun to, to work on uh, coding for that thing. Might have to teach myself a bunch of new skills, but... But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm wondering what language I'm going to need to use for that. Or, uh, but yeah, it, it'll just probably depend on what kind of APIs are, are available. So uh, that's, um, I, mean, I guess there are current events, but I don't, don't really feel like talking about uh, current events at the moment. If, if you have any questions, though, or any topics that you think I should cover, uh, philosophy, current events, science, um, I just leave, leave something in the comments, and uh, if I find it interesting, I'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, talk about it in, in the next video. So, that's all. Uh, I'll see you next week.